happy Saturday, everybody. Coming up on the show, we have someone who was inspired by the cynic philosophers, particularly Diogenes, who I have a soft spot for. So we thought it would be a good time to go back to our episode on Diogenes, which originally came out in July of 2015. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And it's been a little while, Tracy, since we've done any episodes on ancient history. That is correct. So today, do you want to go back to 400 BCE with me and talk about an enigmatic Greek philosopher? Yeah, sure thing. So this guy is really quite a fun character. Uh, he opted for a life of poverty to one of comfort. He was a self-proclaimed citizen of the world. He's sometimes... Um, uh, uh, credited with inventing the word cosmopolitan relating to being a citizen of the world. Uh, he was an enemy of pretense. He was an avant-garde thinker and he was also a humorist. So he had a lot of irons in the fire of philosophy. And this is Diogenes of Sinope. And I've heard, I've listened to a bunch of pronunciations. Some uh, put an accent on the middle syllable. So it's Sinope. Sinope sounds more natural to me, so we're going with that. Apologies if that irritates anyone. Uh, but the trick with him is that his biography is based almost entirely on apocryphal stories. There is some, but not much, solid information about his life. And additionally, it appears that he didn't write down any of his own philosophy. There is some debate over that, but there's really been no evidence that he did. So what we have is... Uh, information that's been passed down by his students and biographers, sometimes, you know, several centuries later. And I, I have to admit with my own personal kind of uh, point of view on this, that I kind of look at Diogenes of Sinope as a sort of ancient Greek Tyler Durden. And that may become more apparent and uh, why I would think that as we talk about his ideals and his philosophy. And his life also reads in some ways like one long Monty Python sketch. So, it's quite fun. Uh, this is not one where you're going to get a lot of horrible stuff, although there are some twists and turns. But I think it will be an enjoyable little trip to the ancient past. So let's do it. Diogenes is usually cited as being born in the year 412 BCE. And as with much of ancient history, not really confident on that date. He was born in Sinope, Paphlagonia, on the coast of the Black Sea. And there's not really a lot known about his childhood. We do know that his father worked with money, although we don't know the precise nature of the work. Some biographies listed as one and some as another. He could have been a minter or perhaps a money changer or simply a banker. And we do know that Diogenes worked alongside his father. And specificity as to the specific job title aside, the really interesting part of this relationship with money is that at some point, Diogenes and his father together, or Diogenes alone, or even his father alone, but uh, taken credit by Diogenes, started defacing the currency that they were working with. There have been lots of archaeological finds that corroborate that a lot of currency from the time was damaged. But we don't really know why coin defacement was the hobby of Diogenes and possibly his father, although there are some theories on that. Yeah, it may have been a politically driven move related to the Greco-Persian wars of the time. Uh, another perspective on the currency defacement features the oracle at Delphi playing a fairly significant role. In the text Lives of Eminent Philosophers, written in the 3rd century CE by Diogenes Laertius, there is a discussion of Diogenes either being urged by the oracle to commit this vandalism, uh, although he was urged to vandalize political currency and instead to face state currency, or of being called to the oracle after the fact to realize that his behavior had been predestined. And we're not certain, again, of how this particular habit of currency vandalism actually played out in terms of repercussions. There are accounts that uh, Diogenes was exiled for this behavior, and some of them involve a lot of... Um, interplay with his father and who was taking blame and who really did it. But there are also conflicting accounts that say that Diogenes fled before he could ever be tried for the crime. Whichever of those scenarios was the case, Diogenes did move to Athens after this whole currency incident. This would wind up being a pivotal move because it's at this point that he started down the path of philosophy. One of Socrates' former students, Antisthenes, took Diogenes on as a student of his own. 
Uh, in a much contested, and we'll keep saying that, but I just want to point out, like, there, there are ongoing debates over the veracity of various accounts. Uh, but in a much contested version of the story of how Diogenes became Antisthenes' disciple, Diogenes Laertius, uh, tells of how Diogenes had to really wear Antisthenes down before the elder man finally conceded to take him on as a student. When Antisthenes raised a stick to Diogenes to drive him away, his devotion was so vehement uh, to becoming a pupil that he put his head in the path of the stick and said, strike, for you will not find any stick hard enough to drive me away as long as you continue to speak. Uh, and while we're also continuing to talk about contested facets of the Diogenes story, we actually don't know for certain that he really did study under Antisthenes. This is something that still gets debated to this day uh, by historians and classicists. So keep all of that in mind as we go. To say Diogenes was an impassioned student would really be an understatement. He took the lessons of Antisthenes to extremes, believing that he had to live the philosophy rather than really t- just, just talk about it. He wanted to reject artificiality and the luxury of a, of Athenian life. In fact, he wanted to reject creature comforts so badly that he decided to live in a tub in a building dedicated to the goddess Sibylle. Uh, some accounts indicate that it was actually an empty wine barrel and not a tub and that he was merely in a public square. But regardless of the details of his tub or barrel, he was inspired, he said, by the mouse, which was a creature which he admired greatly for the adaptability that it showed. It didn't need all of these trappings. It could just live anywhere. Naturally, there's a whole other account of how he came to be living in this cask or tub. And in this version, he wrote ahead to a friend in Athens that he was coming and that his friend should find him suitable accommodations. The friend was unable to secure lodgings for Diogenes, and so the possibly exiled man opted for a nearby barrel or tub in the public square. In Lives of Eminent Philosophers, Diogenes then questioned as to his habit of living on the streets, said that the Athenians had already built him places to live in, meaning all of the public spaces around him. It's an interesting approach to life. Uh, but before we talk a little bit about some of the ideals that Diogenes expounded on, uh, we're going to pause for a quick word from a sponsor. Diogenes owned nothing, and he depended on the kindness of others and some wiggly logic that we're going to talk about momentarily uh, in order to survive. He did at one point allegedly possess a cup. Uh, that is, until he saw a young boy drinking from his cupped hands, at which point Diogenes threw the vessel away, claiming that it was simply an unnecessary possession. So you may wonder how a philosopher living on the streets managed to survive the elements. He's said to have taken up the habit of training himself to withstand any conditions. So he would roll in hot sand during warm weather and embrace cold marble statues in cold weather. Uh, those, those may be fantastical fables of Diogenes. We just don't know. Uh, he did believe that manners were a form of lying. So he was pretty comfortable being really outspoken and really brutally honest. Uh, he's also said to have pretty commonly urinated in public and even masturbated openly. Uh, basically any of the natural human activities that someone might do in private as part of living in a, a civilized society. Diogenes felt those should all be allowed in public. That's part of authentic life. When I first started looking at your outline, Holly, I got to this part about believing that manners were a form of lying. So he was just outspoken and brutally honest. And I was like, I think I used to date this guy. And then I got to the (laughs) next sentence and was like, nope, did not date this guy. (laughs) Thank goodness. There's another story of a wealthy group of people throwing Diogenes bones during a banquet and calling him a dog, after which he lifted his leg and urinated on them canine style. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk some more about dogs because they are often associated with him. But this is basically this time in Athens when he was doing all of these, to some seemingly outlandish things of living publicly in a tub or barrel and peeing on people that bothered him. Uh, he's, people started to call him crazy. <laughs> In fact, Plato supposedly called Diogenes, quote, a Socrates gone mad. So the relationship between Diogenes and Plato was not simply a matter of mild name calling. 
Diogenes was very openly critical of Plato's work. For example, one of the ongoing philosophic discussions of the day was analysis of the nature and definition of what it meant to be human. Plato had defined man as a featherless biped animal. To point out the limited view of this definition, Diogenes plucked a fowl, possibly a chicken, and brought it with him into the Philosopher's Academy, showing everyone how he was carrying, by Plato's definition, a human being. Yeah, I always get, this is one of the famous stories of Diogenes, and I always get a little hung up on it because it's not the chicken's natural state. So you can't be claiming that. But again, he was a humorist. So any uh, the first prop comic, perhaps. Um, the debate over the nature of man and what defined humanity continued to lead to more eccentric behavior on the part of Diogenes. So he would walk the streets of Athens carrying a lantern. Sometimes you'll see it uh, described as a candle, but m- much more commonly as a lantern, even during daylight. And he would hold it up to people's faces, claiming to be looking for an honest man and never finding it. So we're laughing at this guy pretty openly, and it's important to point out that Diogenes was considered very humorous. So while he was on the surface looking for an honest human being in a way that might have seemed crazy at best or jerkish at the worst, he was using comedy to make a statement about the people of Athens having lost their humanity. He really felt that humans were living in pretense rather than in harmony with nature. That's where he starts to sound a lot like Tyler Durden to me. Um, We should also mention, though, that he was not the first or only philosopher who believed that most humans were walking around in this sort of contrived dream state of inauthenticity. Uh, Heraclitus, Sophocles, and Plato all tackled similar issues in their work, but none of them took to the streets to challenge people openly and in their faces about it. To further comment on the trappings of human constructs, Diogenes would say that he sometimes saw man as the brightest and wisest of all animals, but when he saw that fortune tellers and soothsayers were heavily patronized, he thought that mankind was the most foolish animal of all. And he really believed pretty implicitly that humans should be self-sufficient as part of their natural state. Like, he really thought we exist in a way that we could totally take care of ourselves if we got rid of all of these societal constructs. Uh, but he also did a little bit of fancy footwork uh, philosophically to make sure that his needs were met while he was living his natural self-sufficient tub life. He would expound, for example, that all elements are in all things and that all substances are united. So snatching a little bit of food or stealing a little bit of wine was just making use of the natural elements that are all around you in the vapor. They just happen to take the form of sustenance. And apparently, despite all the public urination and open criticism of literally everyone around him, Diogenes was much beloved in Athens. Yeah, people really thought, I mean, they called him crazy, but they also thought he was very smart and he had a lot of interesting ideas. So he's such a fascinating creature. Um, And Diogenes of Sinope, with his disdain for social constructs, is also considered the father of cynicism. And this is where the dogs come in. So the word cynicism is related to the Greek word for dog. And there's no historical consensus as to how dogs came to be so closely associated with Diogenes and his philosophy. But there are several popular theories. The first one is that he extolled the virtues of the dog's way of living as being entirely without pretense, which people who love dogs would probably agree with. Uh, the second one is that his mentor, Antisthenes, taught at a school called Sinosarges, which I may be pronouncing wrong. Uh, but that translates roughly to place of the white dog. So it was more of a, a linear homage to his teacher than anything else. And the third suggestion kind of loops back to the first one, which is that it's a comparison between Diogenes' philosophy of anti-pretense and the general characteristics of a dog. Yeah, so that one is more like from other people saying, hey, you kind of live like a dog, rather than him going, dogs are awesome, they're not pretentious. It's more of one that's put on him rather than him uh, expounding on. And this association of dogs with Diogenes uh, persisted throughout his life and beyond. If you look at any uh, artist renderings of the philosopher, the majority of them, I would say, because there have been a lot of paintings of him throughout the years, feature one or more dogs by his side. There are a lot of images of him kind of tucked into his little tub or his cask, and sometimes there are four or five dogs just around him. 
there are almost always dogs in the picture. So right, things are about to get a little bit wacky. Here's what's going on. So while he was traveling at one point, the story goes that Diogenes was actually captured by pirates. you got to have pirates in a good wacky story. Uh, and then he was taken to Crete and he was sold as a slave to uh, Xenids of Corinth. And as a slave, Diogenes allegedly told his new owner that he had no special skills or abilities other than governing men. So he was made a tutor to uh, Xenia's children, and eventually he was considered a member of the family rather than a slave. In an alternate version of the story, Diogenes actually chose Xenia's as the man that the pirate should sell him to, saying that his potential master looked like he really needed to be governed. Many different details compete with one another when it comes to the relationship between Diogenes and the man who purchased him. He might have been set free immediately and then employed. He might have started out as a slave and then slowly that aspect of the relationship diminished. Or he might have stayed a slave, although uh, one with a great deal of personal freedom, his entire life. Yeah, we just don't know. And and that's another... Another one of those things, the different tellings put it different ways and different um, translations have probably led to some of that uh, muddy water in that arena. And despite the fact that he was technically a slave during at least part of this time in Corinth, it does appear that Diogenes lived there in much the same way that he did in Athens. So he slept and bathed and gave his lectures in public spaces and he eschewed the trappings of society And he continued to share and live his philosophy of personal responsibility and minimalist living. As for the lessons that he bestowed upon the children that he was tasked with teaching, he not only taught them academics, but also riding, archery, and stone slinging. When the boys were in the gymnasium, he was adamant that they not be trained in the standard athletic style, but in a gentler manner, getting their heart rates up and color in their cheeks, but not really pushing to extremes. Yeah, this one always seems kind of odd to me. It's one of the many later writings about him because you see him so often depicted uh, as walking with a cane. And so like picturing him teaching them all of these physical things seems odd to me, but you never know. Perhaps it was true. Um, there's another sort of famous story about him involving his time in Corinth when Diogenes allegedly had an encounter with Alexander the Great. Apparently, Alexander wanted to meet this unconventional philosopher because he had heard a great deal about him. And when he finally found this man on the streets of Corinth and inquired as to whether he was, in fact, the philosopher that he sought, Diogenes is said to have replied, yes, get out of my sunlight. The eccentric philosopher openly criticized Alexander, which perhaps surprisingly actually endeared him to the ruler so much so that the king of Macedonia once said that if he were not Alexander the Great, he'd be Diogenes of Sinope. In another belittling move, Diogenes supposedly responded, if I were not Diogenes, I would also wish to be Diogenes. (laughs) He's he's genuinely funny. (laughs) That's such a good zinger. I love it. Uh, he would lecture in public spaces, and if no one stopped to listen, he got in this really interesting sort of cruel, it's almost clickbaiting of <laughs> the, the uh, ancient style. He would start whistling until onlookers came, and once he had drawn a few people and gotten their attention, he would then berate them for coming to listen to him whistling and being musical and point out how ignorant they were that they did not stop earlier to listen to the far more important things he had to share, i.e. his philosophy. Sort of reminds me of when, uh, like, Joshua Bell, a virtuoso violinist, will just busk in the subway and yeah. sort of walk on by, <laughs> not realizing what's happening. Uh, Diogenes lived the remainder of his life in Corinth, Greece, and died there in 323 BCE at the age of 90. His cause of death is as cloaked in murky variations as basically every other part of his life story. Varying accounts list a dog attack uh, resulting in rabies, which would have been kind of ironic considering all the previous dog stuff. Food poisoning, eating a raw ox hoof or maybe a raw octopus. Uh, and even committing suicide by holding his breath until he died. And that last one is just as unlikely as it sounds. <laughs> Probably he just died of old age. Yeah, I, I think some of these stories were probably written to add drama. But 
he was elderly when he died and he had been around a very long time. And that was quite an old age. Uh, I, I love that there are accounts that say he held his breath until he died. That can't work. You pass out and start automatically breathing. <laughs> but uh, while Diogenes had told people that he should be thrown to the dogs as food when he died, he was instead given a proper and honorable burial. He was, again, despite being this really eccentric, cranky, public urinator, very beloved. Uh, the account of his death plan is a little bit different in the third century Diogenes Laertius writings. There, he is said to have told uh, Xenians that, in fact, he wanted to be buried on his face, quote, because in a little while, everything will be turned upside down. And with that statement, he was referring to the political situation at the time. Uh, the Macedonians were rising in power, and he thought a pretty big cultural shift was going to undoubtedly follow that. A statue of the philosopher was later erected in Sinop, Turkey, and it features a dog by his side and the signature lantern that he would shine in people's faces. Yeah, so that is the the more modern day version of uh, where he was born. And one of the reasons I think that the life of Diogenes comes with a lot of variation in the telling and most likely some outright fabrication is that he was a larger than life personality. And sometimes that will kind of build you know, people will build on some very real larger than life things and kind of add their own embellishments. But I really like uh, this one story about him that is a nice way to kind of sum up his his life, particularly at the end, because allegedly as he was nearing the end of his life, he was getting very old. People would ask him why he insisted on continuing living his difficult path of poverty when he really could retire and live in greater comfort. Again, he was much beloved. He probably had a lot of options and plenty of people that would have been happy to take him in. And he may have still been uh, part of Xenia's family. We don't entirely know. But his response was apparently, why so? Suppose I had run a long distance. Ought I to stop when I was near the end and not rather press on? I love him. He's so dedicated to <laughs> his whole thing. I love that he's funny. I mean, sometimes uh, we laugh at people's foibles in the in the podcast because they are humorous. We don't often get to laugh at somebody who's being deliberately comical in the podcast. Uh, so this is a, yeah. nice, a nice change of pace from feeling mildly guilty about laughing at somebody's comical foibles. Yeah, he knew his foibles were what they were. He he had a really good sense of like what he was he was drawing out of people. He was trying to get people to think through comedy, which I I always am a big fan of. I think he's brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 